I'm not sure what to think when the choir sings be still right before I'm supposed to get up and speak. <laughs> Actually, it's very beautiful. Thank you for setting a worshipful tone as we, uh, as we worship on this Lord's Day. It's good to be with you this morning. I particularly want to welcome those of you who might be guests with us this morning. We're glad that you're here and pray that uh, this is a time where we all experience the spirit and presence of Jesus Christ. I'd like to invite you to stand as you're able as we join together in our call to worship, which is printed on the front of the bulletin, or you can follow along on the screens as we read responsively. Stand at your watch post and wait for the Lord. We wait for our vision of truth and hope. Stand at your watch post and pray to the Lord. We pray for righteousness. Stand at your watch post and trust in the Lord. We trust the Lord and hear our eyes and make justice prevail. Stand at your watch post and wait for the Lord. I'd like to invite you to remain standing as we continue in worship by singing our first hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, hymn number 103. You can find it in the hymnals or you can follow along on the screen. opening prayer. Let us pray. God of righteousness, hear our prayer. We come before you with zeal in our hearts, seeking justice for the wronged, hope for the downhearted, and healing for the afflicted. We strain to see your face and behold the glory of your salvation. Visit us in our need and transform us in your image that salvation may come to our house this day through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let's take a moment to greet one another. Morning, back row. Love you guys. The bear. Yeah.
So once again, welcome, and uh, I want to remind you, if you are at the end of the row, if you would uh, take those attendance pads and sign them and pass those down the row, or you can go online to uh, do stmarscarmel.org slash attend. One thing is we are having a new member class today. If you've not already indicated that you want to be a part of that, you can mark that on the attendance pad or on the online form. So uh, <clears throat> the uh, Steph Mabe, the, our, our now United Women in Faith, formerly United Methodist Women president, always gives me a task. So they are, the, the United Women in Faith are having their annual uh, arts and crafts fair. So what I don't understand, though, is I have to get a good answer from Stephanie, is why I got this tag, but Pastor Carla got this one. I'm just saying. Evidently. Maybe I'm past my expiration date. I don't know. But uh, the... the uh, the United Women in Faith on November 5th from 9 to 3 will have their annual Arts and Crafts Fair. And that supports, the proceeds from that help support the mission work of the, the United Women in Faith. All crafts and artwork will be handmade by either area artisans or by members of our church. Refreshments will be available at the Candy Cane Cafe as well as a bake sale. So if you have questions, you can talk to Steph Mabe. Steph, are you here? There, Steph back, is back here, so she's, she's waving her hand. You can also ask her why I'm marked down. <laughs> it's a secret, evidently. We also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, want to invite you to uh, join us for the new member class. If you're new to St. Mark's, you don't have to have decided to join to be a part of the class. If you just want to get to know a little bit more about St. Mark's, meet the pastors, things like that, it's a good opportunity to do that. Today at 4 o'clock, we'll be hosting a concert by the Hoosier Brass Band. This is a British brass band style group and uh, really uh, uh, entertaining concert. I hope you'll take some time to attend. We have a couple of our members, Ed Rao and myself, who are part of the, the band, and uh, so you'll see a couple of familiar faces there. And finally, we are beginning our stewardship emphasis today, which is under, around the theme Earn, Save, Give, which are Wesleyan terms, as uh, John Wesley advised his uh, constituents to earn all they can, save all you can, and then give all you can. And so we'll be uh, piloting through those themes the next few weeks. And right now, I'm going to invite Scott Baker, who is our stewardship chairperson, to come and share a few words. Thank you, Brian. Good morning. Uh, as Brian said, I'm Scott Baker, the stewardship chairman representing the stewardship team this year. And as our time for stewardship approaches, we must turn to God in the heaven for guidance. He will lead our St. Mark's family to new heights and new rewards. But to get us started, I'm going to take us to a place that really you wouldn't think of a starting point, and that is Hollywood. But don't worry, I'll bring you back at warp speed. Remember the TV series and the movies Star Trek? Imagine you're on the bridge of the USS Enterprise, seeing Captain Kirk, Dr. McCoy, communications office, Luhura, Chekhov, Mr. Zulu at the navigation helm, and of course, Mr. Spock. You remember the opening dialogue, space, the final frontier, this is the voyage of the Starship Enterprise, you kind of get the picture. But did you know we could tie this to right here at our own St. Mark's? Thanks to our own Ryan Howe, he's found in our vast video library a link between St. Mark's and Star Trek. Let's take a look.
St. Mark's, a space within space where welcome, serve, grow is a way of life. This is the voyage of the 2023 Stewardship Promise Program. It's four-week mission to provide promises of giving. To boldly look to the heavens for God's guidance. To seek out those who support our church mission. Our operations and facilities, our outreach programs, and into our hearts so that we can achieve new heights. Will you pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, we ask that you give us the wisdom and strength in our hearts as we travel along a path to fulfill what you have in store for our St. Mark's family in this time of stewardship. You are the beacon providing that light along the path. Amen. See, we're back in plenty of time <clears throat> to continue with the service as we ask our own pastoral captain to beam us aboard as we prepare for the promises ahead. Thank you. Our epistle lesson this morning comes from Second Thessalonians. We'll be reading from chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 and 11 through 12. You can follow along on the screens, and I apologize, but I did not make a note of what page it is in your Bible, so maybe just watch the screens. 205. 205, thank you. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your steadfastness and your faith during all your persecutions and the afflictions that you are enduring. To this end, we always pray for you asking that our God will make you worthy of his call and will fulfill by his power every good resolve and work of faith so that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God.
and Casey, what a beautiful anthem. As we prepare our hearts and minds for prayer this morning, I will, as is our custom, invite you to a time of silent prayer in which you might offer your petitions to God, listen to God's spirit to speak into your hearts and minds. And then I'll lead us in a spoken pastoral prayer and the Lord's Prayer. So let us uh, begin our time of prayer this morning with a time of silence in which we speak to God and in which God speaks to us. Let us pray. Sometimes, God, 
we do not know how to pray, but your spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. We pray together for the needs of the world this morning. There is injustice in our world, O oh God, and evil sometimes surrounds us. We pray for those in this country and around the world whose poverty is caused by the greed of others. We look at our world, O oh God, and we see the ways that we have mistreated it. We pray, O oh God, that you might heal the earth as you make us better stewards of your good creation. Your own beloved body is broken in pieces and scarred by wounds that do not heal. Instill your church with the desire to be whole and make us one with one another that we may worship you in unity. We pray, O oh God, for those places where there is despair, violence and corruption, protect us, cleanse us, heal us. Provoke in us the desire for the common good for the sake of those who suffer the most. So many we love are racked by pain in body, mind, or spirit. So many more we do not know yearn for healing and care. Pour out your healing spirit upon them and make us agents of your blessing. For all those whose burdens are carried in secret and for our own needs, we pray. Our hearts, our hands, our voices are yours, O oh God. Increase our faith, sustain our hope, and send us out to do your work and show your love. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is our all in all. And together we pray in the name of Jesus, the prayer which Christ taught the disciples to pray, the prayer that we say together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Throughout the month of October, St. Mark's is raising funds for the United Methodist Committee on Relief. UMCOR comes alongside those who suffer from natural or human-caused disasters, be it famine, hurricane, war, flood, fire, or other events, to alleviate suffering and to be a source of help and hope for those who are most vulnerable. They provide relief, response, and long-term recovery grants when these events overwhelm a community's ability to recover on their own. Learn more about the many ways UMCOR serves the world at stmarkscarmel.org backslash missions. Financial donations to UMCOR may be given using the mission envelope in your bulletin or given online at stmarkscarmel.org backslash give. Let us pray. Compassionate God, as Jesus did for Zacchaeus, you reach across the chasms of what we've created the ones where we've isolated ourselves from the redemptive power of your love. As with Zacchaeus, bridges have been built, and people who believed they were beyond your embrace have been welcomed to the table with open arms. As we give to you this day, may we also follow the example of Zacchaeus with an explosion of gratitude and generosity, and may we also know his joy. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who invites himself to our table. Amen.
like to invite you to remain standing as we hear this morning's gospel lesson, which comes from Luke chapter 19. Probably one of the more familiar stories in the Bible. Uh, many of you may recognize it from your childhood days in Sunday school, if you were in Sunday school. Uh, I remember singing the song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. You went to the same Sunday school I did. Well, let us hear this story, which is familiar, but let's try to hear it in fresh ways as we, uh, as we share this word today. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he, was not, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus hurried down and was happy to welcome Jesus. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, Half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. So when I was a child, not not child or young enough to sing the Zacchaeus song, but a little bit older, we used to play a board game which hasn't evidently stood the test of times because I don't see it around much anymore. And that board game was called Careers. Anybody remember playing Careers when you were a kid? Really, yeah, a few people. Um, the interesting thing about the the careers board game is you would you would go around the board and you would select a career and that would put you on a different path and and what kind of career you had um, then dictated how much money you got at certain places and different things. But the really unique feature of this game was at the beginning of the game, you decided what the winning combination of factors was that would, would let you declare that you were winning, the winner of a game. Now, there were three categories. You could have stars, hearts, or dollars. And stars represented fame, so you could, you could say you're going to have so much fame. Hearts was happiness. Why would anybody not pick happiness? And then dollars represented money. So you had to, you had to get a combination of 60 in those three categories. But you could pick to have, I, I had a cousin who always picked getting all money. They were always gonna get 60 in the money category. I always was the pragmatist that, that I still am, and so I would, I would select 20, 20, 20. I'd always get 20 in happiness, 20 in, in uh, fame, and 20 in stars. And, and then at the end of the game, so you never quite knew who was winning because you didn't know what combination they had selected in order to win the game. So it wasn't until all of a sudden somebody says, okay, I, I've won, I've got what I need, that, uh, that you knew who was, in fact, the winner. I think about that game occasionally because I think it, it certainly for my preteen mind, made me think about, okay, what is important? What are the things that I want to collect in life? What are the things that I value? And what does it mean to succeed in this life? Not just as a board game measure success, but how we might measure success. One of the great stories in the Old Testament is, is about Samuel. David was Samuel's dad, father, and when Samuel or, or um, excuse me, Solomon. Solomon was David's son. And when David died, the, God appeared to Solomon, and God said to Solomon, uh, ask whatever you wish, 
and I'll give it to you. Now, that's kind of all of our dream, isn't it? That somebody would say, you know, tell me what you want, and I will give it to you. And yet there are countless fictional stories in the world about people who have uh, answered that question wrongly and how the consequences of that. Solomon, however, had a, a moment of clarity in which he said to God, please give your servant a discerning mind in order to govern your people and to distinguish good from evil because no one is able to govern, govern this important people of yours without your help. Historically, we say what Solomon asked for was wisdom to govern the people that God had given into his care. And so as we think about what's important in our lives, as we begin this journey of thinking about what it means to, to earn, to save, to give, to, to evaluate what things we collect and what we disperse in the name of God, it's important to begin that with a sense of wisdom and purpose. And so we turn to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is one of those really wonderful characters in the Bible. And most of us, when we are small, we really enjoy hearing about Zacchaeus because most of us at some point in our lives have been that person who's on the outside trying to get a glimpse of what the insiders see. And so Zacchaeus is that. But let's take a couple of steps back from this. Zacchaeus is a tax collector. Now, in Israel, in Palestine at this time, to be a tax collector meant you were an agent for Rome, which would be bad in and of itself. But most tax collectors uh, collected more than Rome required. They were, if you were a tax collector, you had, to, you had to collect at least as much as Rome required, but you could collect more if you were able to do that. And if you collected more, you kept the, dis the difference. And so uh, tax collectors in Zacchaeus' time were notorious for skimming off the top, collecting more than they needed to give to Rome, and skimming off the top. Now, how popular do you think that would make you in your neighborhood? Not very popular, would it? And so the tax collectors were an ostracized group. They didn't get invited to the best parties or any parties. They didn't get uh, chatted up on the sidewalk as the neighbors were walking their dogs. They were, uh, people moved quickly past their house hoping they would not pay any more attention to them than absolutely necessary. And so Zacchaeus was in this, this, uh, this class of people that were despised because of their collusion with Rome, but also because they generally took more than they needed to give Rome and kept pocketed the difference. And so that's Zacchaeus in this moment. So he comes and he's wanting to see Jesus. Now, if Zacchaeus were well liked, I suspect people would move out of his way and let him see uh, Zacchaeus. <clears throat> It's sort of like uh, when Jesus is coming by, staking your claim at the, the Carmel Fourth of July parade. <laughs> I see you've been there. And so they, they, however, Zacchaeus was not well liked, so they didn't say, oh Zacchaeus, here, come up in the front, we know you can't see. They, they created a wall to keep him out. And so Zacchaeus says, the only way I'm going to see this parade is if I get ahead of it, I climb up a tree, I find some vantage point to see Jesus as he passes by. So Zacchaeus at some point recognized that there was something missing in his life. Otherwise, he wouldn't have worked this hard to see Jesus. And so there is this budding sense of wisdom there that he recognized there's more than just all of the money that he has collected. So he climbs the tree and he sees Jesus and there is this, this uh, exchange that is immortalized by our little song in which Jesus sees Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus sees Jesus and, 
Jesus laughs. You can just imagine Jesus laughing. I always, I think Jesus laughed a lot more than we give him credit for in a lot of how we portray Jesus. Jesus laughed. He said, Zacchaeus, what are you doing up there? You look silly. Come down from that tree and I'll come to your house. If you're, if you're that intent on seeing me, I'll come to your house. We'll share a meal. Let's talk. Now you can imagine all the people in the crowd saying, wait a minute, did he just say what I thought he said? Is he going to Zacchaeus' house? We don't go to Zacchaeus' house. We give it a wide berth. So Jesus went to the house of Zacchaeus, and they have a meal. And during the meal, Zacchaeus says a surprising thing. And yet there's, there's kind of progression even here. Zacchaeus says, Lord, I'm going to give half of everything I've uh, collected and give it to the poor. Now, I suspect he had collected a lot. And you would think off the, off the, at, the, at the top of this conversation, you'd think, well, that's a very generous offer, isn't it? To, to take half of what he's given and give it to the poor. But this is one of those times when I just imagine Jesus sitting at lunch and Zacchaeus says, Lord, I'm going to give half of what I've collected to the poor. And there are crickets. You imagine Jesus saying, now how many of you just got uncomfortable? <laughs> well, I suspect Jesus was quiet long enough that Zacchaeus got very uncomfortable. And after he thought about it for a minute, he says, well, and on top of that, if I've cheated anybody, wink and a nod, if I've cheated anybody, I will give them back multiples of what I owed them. And at that moment, Jesus says, okay, I think we're getting there. I think you're beginning to get this generosity thing that I'm trying to to help you understand. See, because it wasn't, it wasn't just that Jesus was about justice in this situation. He was about generosity. He was about Zacchaeus seeing his life in a different way. It was about being in the middle of the careers game and, and, and racing the end game that you have and putting different numbers there and suddenly realizing the 60 I had in the, in the dollar sign column is, is not what I want. I want happiness. I want God. I want something more. Because the soul level of importance of our relationship with money is about more than just what we collect. It's about the gratitude and the generosity we share with those around us. We don't get to hear any more from this story. We, we hear about this change of heart from Zacchaeus, which is a wonderful thing. We hear uh, a moment in which he uh, begins, the light bulb comes on, he begins to understand that his priorities are not God's priorities, that he has mistaken what's important. And he's beginning to realize what is important. But then the story ends. And this is one of those times, like many times, where I'd like to have more of the story. I'd like to know what happens the next day and the next month and the next year. I wonder if when Zacchaeus died at a ripe old age, people came to his funeral and said, what a wonderful man Zacchaeus was. How generous. How lovely of spirit. How different than the story they would have told about him at the beginning of this episode. And so Zacchaeus has changed. And I suspect not only is Zacchaeus changed, but his relationship with God was changed. And his relationship with his neighbors with his uh, fellow citizens in the town of Jericho, that it changed everything. 
It was a literal game changer. When we pray for wisdom from God, it is a game changer. It is a reminder of what's important. It transforms us and transforms our goals in life and our goals as a church. One of the things we say often is because you give, St. Mark's gives. It reminds us that the generosity that we have as a congregation is not just about uh, the church at St. Mark's. It's about us giving back. It's about our living out our faith with generosity. Our, uh, our textbook in, for the next few weeks as we think about this earn, save, give, says life is a circle of giving and receiving. We receive gifts from God. We give them back to God and others. Then we receive gifts again and we give again. All of a sudden, Zacchaeus had a change in how he lived his life. Instead of just receiving, receiving, and hoarding, suddenly there was this generative cycle of receiving and giving. We don't know if he continued to be a tax collector. If he did, I suspect he was a very different tax collector than he was before. That instead of taking more than he deserved, he began to give more than others deserved. Stephen Covey, in his book, The Eighth Habit, says, leadership is communicating to people their worth and potential so clearly that they come to see it in themselves. Let me say that again. Leadership is communicating to people their worth and potential so clearly that they come to see it in themselves. The wonderful thing about Jesus is he saw potential and he saw worth in people that others didn't value or see potential in. And so he left a legacy of giving and those to whom he gave, gave on to the next generation. Jim Harnish in our book says, there is a relational quality to wisdom that is deeper than knowledge and reaches beyond the accumulation of information. So we live in an age where we have more information at our fingertips than any age before us. So is everybody in agreement that that has made, her a, made us a wiser, kinder world? There's a big difference between information and wisdom, isn't there? You can know a lot of things without being wise in how you act upon those things. He goes on to say, even as wisdom grows out of our relationship with God, it passes on through our relationship with others. Wisdom is about our relationship with God, but it also defines our relationship with others. This was a moment in which Zacchaeus was changed by God, and it, there was this relationship with Jesus that is important to the story, but it's also about his changing relationship with the other people in his sphere of influence. It was making things right with his neighbors and friends. There was a ripple effect to what Jesus did in his life. And I think that as we give our lives and our purposes to God, there is a ripple effect in which we then impact our neighborhood, our city, our country, our world. There's a a story that I read a few years ago about an, an older man who was planting fruit trees. And this young teenage uh, boy came by and said, what are you doing planting fruit trees? You know, it'll take years before these bear fruit. You'll never get to eat fruit off of these trees. And the man said to the boy, no, he said, but I think, you know, throughout my life, I have eaten the fruit of many trees that I did not plant. It's time to return the favor to the next generation. There are many people whose wisdom has built this congregation, has built Christ's church throughout the world. And we continue to give thanks for all that they have done, but it's also our role to invest in this moment 
and in the next generation of Christ followers. Because we never know when someone who needs to jump up high to see Jesus in their lives, who has to work hard to catch a glimpse of God's love, who has to really examine their own lives to see how they have gotten away from living for others and for God. We never know when they will need to hear the word of grace in their lives. And as we are the church, we provide an opportunity for the future for people to hear that word of grace. Let us pray. Almighty and holy God, give us eyes to see Jesus in our midst. We give you thanks that Jesus continues to pass by, to pass through our lives. And if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, we can notice his incarnation. But we also pray, O God, that you might give us eyes to see and hearts to, to feel for those people who find it difficult to see Jesus. Help us, our lives, to be transparent in such a way that others see the love of Jesus Christ in us and through us. And we pray, O oh God, that we might not only pray for but accept your transforming power in everyone's lives so that we might have our relationships with you and with our neighbors changed because of the, the power of your Holy Spirit. All of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand as you're able to sing our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision, the second stanza of which says, Be Thou My Wisdom. God, let us pray for God to be our wisdom as we are Christ's followers. Now let us go with these words of blessing. Go forth in peace and be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, and the blessing of God be with you and remain with you forever. Amen.